fired up? Are, are we all fired up to, to begin universal ethics? To begin yep. the uh, there in practice, we're gonna let's just take it on head on. Start from the beginning, chapter one, and just go. Go until we 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 finish the book. As we say in Hebrew, we make a seal, we complete it, and uh, we'll celebrate when that happens, God willing, whenever that happens. So okay. So, like I said, let's start at the beginning, chapter one. Uh, I think there was a time I did the introduction years ago. Let's just jump into it. I would I would recommend seeing the introduction, but we're going to just start from chapter one, okay? Chapter one, the soul, the human being in the image of God. This is really the whole foundation of the seven laws. That's how Rabbi Cowan sets it up. Again, this book was, the author of the book is Rabbi Dr. Um, Shimon David Cowan. And um, really, this is the, the, the fundamental basis of the rest of the book. So let's, let's, let's see. Overview. This is on page 15 of the book. The Theory and Practice of Universal Ethics, the Noahi Laws by Shimon David Cowan. Cowan is spelled C-O-W-E-N. So for those of you who don't have the book, you can get it on Amazon. Look up Rabbi or uh, Shimon David or David Cowan, C-O-W-E-N, and you'll find this book. Okay. Overview. The very beginning of the discussion of the theory of the Lohide laws needs to address the fundamental questions. Number one, what is the meaning of the, quote, spiritual within a person? Number two, what is the modality of spiritual knowing? Like what's its description, what's its qualities? And three, what is the content of that knowledge? In parentheses, it says revelation. So I guess that, that you know, he's, he doesn't, he's not starting with an explanation why this is um, so vital to the seven laws. But I guess there's a certain obviousness to it. You know, we talk about not worshiping idolatry and and the, the and faith in God, and so you're already touching on the spiritual right there. And so the first question is, you know, <clears throat> um, but I guess it's more than that. What he's actually saying is, um, like, what's the <clears throat> what what is it exactly that the basis of the requirement within the person um, that pulls them, uh, that makes them seek, that naturally binds them, I should say more, that, that naturally um, obligates them to keep the seven laws. And I think that's what he's getting at, that there's something spiritual within a person that seeks more than just physical satisfaction, like it seems like like the animals of, of just surviving. And um, that's the number one. Understanding ourselves is understanding the seven laws. It goes together. You know, what, what pulls us all to be here tonight? Why do we, you know, why do we interest ourselves in, in religious thought? Well, why do we, why is that in God? You know, where does that come from? And so all that has to do with the first question, because there's something inside of us that, that connects to that part of reality that's, that's something we can't see and we can't smell, but we know it's there, right? And that's a spiritual within the person, is sensitive to that. So that's the first question. So what does that spiritual in the person mean? How do we describe it? And 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 then and what I and the second question is is interrelated. <laughs> Can we describe and explain this knowing to know about it, you know, and and to connect with and feel drawn to spiritual things? And finally, what is that spiritual knowledge that the person is drawn to? Okay. 
The discussion progresses in conjunction with consideration of the thought of a great psychologist and thinker whose work engages modern culture, Viktor Frankl. So we're going to uh, be using Viktor Frankl's thought as a basis um, for discussion here, for the author's discussion, I should really say, <clears throat> about spiritual obligation, about the definition of meaning, or the, and specifically the importance of meaning, and what meaning actually <laughs> means, for lack of a better word. Um, I think the reason why um, Rabbi Cowan does that is because he wants to, you know, attract um, secular people to, to the, the Noahide laws, not just religious people. And so he's trying to communicate the importance of spirituality to everybody, to everyone in who thinks who's part of the modern world. Okay, next paragraph on page 15. The soul is grasped as the spiritual bearer of the human being, the unifier and ultimate representative of the mind, body, soul complex, which makes up the human being. As such, it is responsible and beholden to something beyond the person. The religiously conscious person calls this God. So, so there's two different points he says in the first sentence there of paragraph two. Um, he's saying that the soul is the spiritual bearer of the human being. Again, it's kind of the spiritual receptor of the person. Um, the, the spiritual side of the person allows the person to have spiritual experiences. The second point he makes is that it's the unifier a whole complex of what we call the self, <clears throat> which is made of the mind, the body, and the soul. So that's an important point and to distinguish because it's, it's not always so clearly distinguished between the mind and the soul. Um, some people might think that with our minds alone, <clears throat> we can be led to moral truths. Uh, we can understand that the mind is not controlled by the physical urges of the body. And so it's really a, a conflict between the mind and the body. There were philosophers who had that belief. But he's saying no. You know, and this is more of the traditional Jewish approach, or certain the Hasidic approach, that there's mind, there's body, but there's something beyond the mind. There's something that is some things that we experience that we can't explain rationally. And that's that's connected to the soul. And in the end, the soul is really the one who's, who is the actual unifier and, and really uh, has the power, at least, to dominate the other um, facets of the human being. Okay, any questions or comments so far? Um, there's also this also this 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 last sentence, uh, last two last two sentences are very important and related to where we're going. I'll repeat them as such. It is responsible and beholden to something beyond the person. The soul, which is the highest level of the person, is beholden to something beyond the person, and to the religiously conscious person, that's called God. So in other words, the the moral and spiritual good reality um, that's basically God's reality. And it's God that communicates it to the soul. And the soul is sensitive to that reality. So there's an objective uh, reality uh, which affects conduct, um, which is not something the person makes up themselves. It's not something the person deduces even through their mind. It's something that's coming from another source, but the soul picks up on it and is sensitive to it and is beholden to it. Okay, paragraph three on page 15. 
the soul's knowledge of God is ultimately non-cognitive. So it's not based on the senses or thought or the thinking process. It sees the manifestation of God whose existence transcending the inner worldly domain in which intellect operates cannot be established by intellect. So God's existence is something that's above and beyond um, the bounds of intellect. And, and it can't be established by the intellect. So here, Dr. Cowan is, is um, going his own way. He's departing from the approach of the early philosophers and medieval philosophers, even up until the modern era, that believe that you can prove God through intellectual, you know, rational proofs. And he seems to be saying that's not the case. Or at the very least, that you can actually um, limit the distinction between the two schools by saying that what he's referring to is something, as he says, knowledge of God and seeing, meaning that level, meaning a real sense of God is not something the mind can do. You may be able to, to prove simply existence of God, but you're not experiencing God. There's a very, very big difference. The soul's knowledge is like people knowing each other. I mean, an example that is often brought in Tanya and other Hasidic, in other Hasidic sources is the verse in Genesis in which it says, Adam knew um, Eve or Chava, his wife. Um, then that knowledge is intimacy. That's, so that's one of the meanings in Hebrew of the word to know is intimate. So in other words, it means to really uh, um, know something in terms of its real qualities. You know, not just to know that it exists, and to, but to actually, you know, to, to, to have close um, relationship with the thing, to have certain sense of it, to really know what the qualities of this other. And the, and the soul has that kind of knowledge of God, to the extent that we can even say that it sees this. So then, in other words, it's such a reality, and it's internalized. Because when you see something, you respond to what you see. I think there's almost no other sense that we respond to as strongly as sight. When we see another person, they give off certain, whether it's the way they look, uh, whether it's how they move, what they say, obviously, but affects us emotionally, psychologically. And so that's the power of sight, that the soul actually experiences God in a way that, that it's shaken, it's, well, and affected by the experience. Okay, continuing in the third paragraph here, page 15. Beyond that, the soul is fitted for recognition of the divine attributes. And as much as these attributes, in a reflected degree, also pertain to it, this is the meaning of the biblical statement that you, the human was made in the image of God. So here we're getting a little Kabbalistic. And he's saying that the soul is specifically um, designed in a way that it recognizes God's attributes. And the reason for that is that the soul itself has kind of, uh, I don't know, shall I say, watered down or, you know, um, reflections of God's attributes. On one level, we can say there's just no comparison. On the other, on the other hand, there's some small comparison between the attributes of the soul and the attributes of God. There's some general, general comparison. We can say, oh, this, this is that. This is compassion. The soul has compassion, you know, loving kindness, um, uh, discipline, um, you know, wisdom, understanding, knowledge. We can, we can go through those and say, oh, yeah, those are things that human beings have. But on God's level, it's a completely, completely different animal that we're really, even the words we're using are not, don't really do it justice. It's just, uh, you know, we have to because we have no other way of describing it. But in any event, because the human being on, on a very minute, you know, distant level, but nevertheless has the qualities, therefore we can 
we can relate and have some knowledge of God's qualities because we have them too. <clears throat> this knowledge as affinity is actualized in the imitation of God through conduct of the Noahide laws. So this knowledge basically means that the soul is drawn to um, adopting the same attributes that God has and, and acting out and um, expressing the same attributes. And basically what, what he continues there to say is these attributes are reflected in the seven laws. The seven laws reflect these attributes. So basically what we're saying in, in other languages, you wanna be close to God, you wanna be like God, keep the seven laws. That's what we're saying. Walk in God's ways. How to, when you're talking about something spiritual, and that's, and that's, by the way, also a very big distinction philosophically in terms of Christianity and, and Judaism is that, and I don't really like getting into this too much, but simply the idea of that, the idea of God is as a body, God forbid, um, <clears throat> basically turns the idea of how we come close to him uh, on its head. Because in Judaism, God doesn't have a body, so you can't get close to him by space, simply, you know, getting close to him because you're standing next to him, you see him. Um, those, those things don't work because that's not what God is. And, and, and beyond that also, not even so, and even, even in terms of the emotional ways we become close to other human beings, but just liking them or quote, loving them, because we just like, you know, the things about them is also really not, not the way we become close to God either, even though there is the idea of love and fear of God. But that's not the primary way we become close to him. The primary way is that he, through his attributes, behaves in a certain way. And thus, spiritually, if we, as we, so to speak, mimic that, that's how we become close. And so that creates a fundamental rift, um, uh, division, distinction between, um, you know, what the, I would say at least the outgrowth of, of Christian doctrine and Judaism. I'm not going to get into the whole, you know, into any deeper discussion about it. So don't ask me about it in terms of uh, if you have any questions on what I'm saying. I can all I can really do is direct you to a book that I uh, brought up and I, did, I have a lecture on in the, in, in the past, spoke about, which is uh, Dr. Abraham Livni. Um, in his book, The Return of Israel, he has many chapters about his critiques about Christianity. If you're interested, you can look there. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So at the bottom of page 15, any questions so far? But the beauty of what he's saying is that the seven laws kind of flows from the fact that a human being is created in God's image. And therefore, the natural um, response of the human being is to keep the seven laws. In other words, if we get past the, the coarseness of the body, and we get past the coldness of the mind, and we get to the soul, and we let the soul express itself, that the soul will express itself in keep, through keeping the seven laws with, with, full, with all its passion and as well as vitality. Okay. So obviously this is very, um, this is extremely important in the way we approach the seven laws because it's not that we're approaching it that we're being forced from without, from some, you know, from the divine monarch. And he's saying, you better keep this, otherwise you're going to be punished. And really it has no connection with us. And we just kind of have a rope around our neck or a yoke on our backs. What we're saying is, no, this is naturally what the most true self of the person wants and what is naturally fitting 
for a human being to be doing. So it's a totally different way of looking at the law. It's a totally different way of looking at the commandments. Everybody with me here? Any questions so far? Okay. All right. One, two, three. No questions. Okay. Bottom of page 15. The conduct of these laws is specific and concrete. Laws are very specific and they're concrete. So in other words, they're practical, they relate to this world, they're, they're not they. Knowledge of these laws comes from the Abrahamic tradition, which starts with Adam and Noah, but takes its authority from their reiteration as part of the revelation at Sinai. In that the major world religions relate to these points of origin, they're already prepared for a focused resonance with the universal Noahide covenant at their root. He's basically just saying that all the great cultures of the world have some connection to the Noahide laws. They have some connection even to the Sinai experience in that way. Or as he said before, the Abrahamic tradition. Um, and I think that's something he's talked about in the introduction was that, um, you know, obviously both Christianity and Islam were affected by, by the, as he said, Abrahamic tradition. I guess you could say Judaism. Um, and, but he even goes as far as to say that even Hinduism and Buddhism also, uh, uh, they have more of a spiritual leaning, but also stem from Abraham. And that the gifts that Abraham gave to the children of of Keturah, and that they went with them eastward is referring to, you know, the forebears of those who created the Hindu religion or, and so on and so forth. And they took the ideas of spiritual ideas of Abraham with them. That's the, argu that's the, the argument um, that, um, or that's the point that uh, Dr. Cowan makes in the introduction. So basically what we're saying is, again, I mean, this is very fascinatingly interrelated. The same way we just said that um, the seven laws are, are natural and organic to a person in that the soul is what the soul is all about. It's how the soul wants to express itself. Um, he's also saying that historically speaking, the world is already kind of prepped and primed for the seven laws, because these, these ethics um, of morality historically have, have been, the world has been, and most cultures have been exposed to them already in the past, at least most civilized cultures and societies. So they're, therefore they should be, they're ready to hear it. Okay. Um, number one, the soul on page 16 the spiritual bearer of the person. We have chosen here alongside Noahide theological discussion to invoke the philosophical writings of a great, though in the long dominant milieu of a materialistic Freudian, Freudianism, lonely writer and psychotherapist, Victor E. Frankel. So in other words, Dr. Frankel was an extremely well-known psychotherapist um, who lived around the time of Freud but Freud was the guy who became popular and Dr. Frankel argued with many of his beliefs and therefore um, didn't become the accepted mainstream view um, in psychology, okay? But yeah, we're gonna use his, um, we're gonna use Dr. Frankel's theories um, and uh, teachings as, as a uh, comparison point uh, or a point of reference of how to speak to the secular person about the seven laws. This is a really fascinating idea. Again, what, doc, what Dr. Cohen wants to do is he wants to tell a person who doesn't believe in God in a traditional religious way, why he too should keep the seven laws. And he's going to do that through Dr. Frankel's teachings. Let's see. <clears throat> the great counterweight to Freud in terms of returning the integrity of the spiritual to the person 
because uh, Freud didn't believe in the, in spiritual. He believed the person is basically full of kind of a lot of beastly uh, inclinations, right? Um, anyway, so Frankel was a counterweight and said, no, person you know has a, a spiritual conscience in them, which which desires and needs to have meaning. That's what we're going to get to. So Frankel began as a student of Freud and subsequently left his teaching. His book, Man's Search for Meaning, based on his own physical and psychological survival in the concentration camps, was one of the 10 most influential books of the 20th century, according to a survey of the Library of Congress. Fascinating that how many people have been affected by his ideas, and you'd think from uh, today's media and academia that uh, this person never existed. It's very um, kind of tragic. Anyway, continuing, the book contains the central theme of Frankel's work, that the human being possesses a higher faculty of meaning through which he or she can transcend and psychologically negotiate any predicament, internal or external. So the person possesses a higher sense that's connected to meaningfulness from which the person can overcome any, pro any problem um, in any predicament. The huge resonance which this book found in world culture must nevertheless have occurred at a more grassroots or for the intellectual readers at a private level. In other words, not in academia, but just regular folks bought his book and read his book and, and believed in, you know, and valued what he had to say. For during his life, he passed away in 1997, his doctrine did not find wide dissemination or acknowledgement in public academia and psychotherapeutic practice. Some have argued that it did have an influence, that it is a vital source of whatever consideration of personal meaning there is to be found in modern psychology. So whenever psychologists do refer to the fact that a person is lacking meaning and that's why they're depressed or whatever it is, that that comes from Dr. Frankel. This, however, did not extend to granting his work commensurate recognition in its own terms and integrity. So he's never really been given the recognition that he should have been given. The paradox of its resonance and yet its failure of public influence in influential circus circles attests to the phenomenon of the, the repression of the metaphysical need of which Frankel spoke. In other words, within the institutions of the society, of society that we live in, uh, like I said, in the media, in government, in the schools, um, he's not recognized as having, um, you know, as his ideas of having any value. Uh, he's not discussed in any, in any serious way, probably basically not at all. And, um, and yet, so many people bought his books. So there's so so he's had a strong effect on the public, but not on the institutions of the society we live in. Questions, comments? Okay, nothing in chat. So nobody raising their hand, right? Let me just go down the line in case I don't see you. No. A little yellow hands emojis up. So I guess that means that no questions so far. Okay. Our purpose in discussing the Noahide conception of human being in the image of God in conjunction with Frankel's work is not to present Frankel, Frankel as a source, let alone an authority in Noahide theology or law. He may not even have known about the Noahide laws as such, though undoubtedly the substantial congruence of his work with with this teaching wells out of his own Judaism. So in other words, whatever little Judaism he may have had <clears throat> certainly had, had an effect and an influence on the um, on his the body of his teachings and, on, and, and understanding of psychology. Um, <clears throat> but nevertheless, he's not an authority uh, in Noahide law or theology at all. Okay, that's so I am now finishing page 17, the bottom of page 17, turning to page 18. His work, however, is a valuable vehicle in adumbrating the concept of the soul 
as the image of God in the human being, since his work has already entered and is known in Western culture. So I think what he's saying is he's going to use Frankel's work to explain in secular terms, what do we mean by a human being being made in the image of God? And that's a very important point in the basis of this whole chapter. Moreover, because of its engagement with Freud, it may be a lever in transforming levels in the cultural repression of personal religious experience, largely affected or at least promoted by Freud's writings. <clears throat> so because, because Dr. Frankel's works engaged I, with Freud and I guess argued with it and um, responded to it, so that also makes it a very helpful tool almost like a, almost a weapon, so to speak, uh, in arguing against some of the, um, what's, what's taken to be institutional views about psychology and about the psyche of a person today by um, pointing to Dr. Frankel and his understanding of this supra, um, this highest level of self in the person that's, that's often ignored uh, in modern psychology. Frankel gave the higher meaning seeking and affirming faculty in the person a variety of names. So this faculty and sense in the person to seek meaning and to affirm meaning, he gave in many different names. These include the spirit, unconscious relig religiosity and the moral instinct, the metaphysical need and conscience. So these are all words that you know, again, a person that's not necessarily religious or that uses religious language um, can relate to. This aspect of the self is to be distinguished both from the emotionally and phys physically needy and expressive self of the physical person. <clears throat> so it's not even part of the emotional self of the person because at the end of the day, a person's emotions are self-centered, that they want to be loved, you know, liked, to be famous, um, respected, whatever it is that we, we have emotionally, that's our emotional side. The soul is totally different. Rather, this is the distinctly impelled moral self, which by its nature seeks to persuade intellect to transcend the relatively self-centered existence of the body, bodily personality and do things that are not self-centered. So it's a totally different um, impetus and push that comes from the soul. It's not self-centered, it's outward-centered towards a higher meaning and purpose. It's transcendent. <clears throat> so, you know, this idea of connecting Dr. Frankel's ideas with Noahide Abrahamic Sinaic belief really brings, a, it, it's a tremendous bridge between religious and secular people. Um, and it's also, it brings religious, particular religious people closer to secular people. When we see, uh, in other words, for example, you know, a secular organizations are people that are engaging in compassionate acts towards others or, di or different selfless acts in regards to other people, they may see themselves not being religious, but, <clears throat> armed with these ideas from Dr. Frankel, we could say the impetus is coming from their soul though. You know, they say they don't believe, but why are they really doing it? They really do believe. They're saying they don't because that's the mind talking, but in reality, their, their, their actions are coming from the source of faith, you see. So this is a, this is a tremendous bridge between religious and non-religious people um, that Dr. Frankel created here. We'll see more about this later on. Excuse me really quick. Yes, o please. O Omar's had his hand up for a while. Oh, I haven't seen it probably because of the way my Zoom here is set up. I should, I should change something around here. How do I? Oh, here, Omar. Omar? Yes, Rabbi, question. Uh, right. What percentage of Jews are aware of you know, the Noahide laws. Is this like all Jews know this? Or I you don't just know. I haven't taken Franco. a census. No, no, sorry. I know it's sorry. It's a question that yes, is loaded because obviously you haven't polled all Jews to know 
but yeah, I don't have uh, any. I don't have any data about this. I mean, it's not. Uh, I suppose I mean, edu to get religiously out educated Jews know about it, and that oh. number. I mean, look. I mean. <laughs> The Why I ask? observant because, Jews are, or, yeah. or religious Jews, or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. them, are, mm -hmm. are a minority of Jews today, unfortunately. Oh, um, okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, so suppose I, call I would religion, say that, uh, that most Jews who are not religious or religiously educated are unaware of the seven laws of Noah. Okay, um, they so it, may, it, they are probably more aware of some some Christian things than they are of the seven laws of Noah, unfortunately. At least the right. of those Jews who live in the West. Um, and the reason why I ask is because uh -huh. how do you if you are trying to live by the Noah High Laws and you're trying to encourage others to live by the Noah High Laws, the question comes up, okay, but where did this come from? It is not, the word Noahide does not exist in the Christian Bible. Even when you go back into other various Jewish books, for example, the Kuzari says that it, the, in Genesis 2, chapter 16, it uses the, you know, God commanded that of all the trees in the garden, you should, know those words, it's, it's a mnemonic for the Noah High Laws, but who right. created that? You know, how do you go back and say, well, God gave this to Adam, unless you read Jewish books, you're not going to know this. And most people, sorry, I shouldn't say most people, most people that I speak to don't read the Noah High Jewish books. And so here am I trying to find my sources or identify where you can go and read, but it ends up being, to me, a conversation around Judaism. And I don't want it to be, because I'm, my goal is not to convert anybody. My goal is to just get the knowledge out there of it. But how do you identify the source if the people who are supposed to know don't even know? You get what I'm asking? Well, Can I, I, get, Rabbi? I think there are two points of, of what it is that, that you're asking. Mm -hmm. um, one question you're asking is, um, you know, what <laughs> people are unfamiliar with, uh, with, with the seven laws of Noah, and it doesn't seem to be really, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but the way I understand it, it doesn't seem to be a text for it. Correct. There is no, there's no express open black and white. Hey, it says in the book right here. Here it is exactly. right here in the book. And you don't, and, and there, that doesn't exist. Correct. So that's one question. The second part of the question is I, I don't understand as much, but it's something to do with Jewish people are not familiar with it either. Um, Correct, because I've asked a couple. I don't think I that's know. really, really that relevant if Jewish people know about it or not. Um, mm. I'm not, I mean, again, because as you mentioned in your question, we're trying to get, you're trying to get away from saying, let's adopt Judaism. So, Correct. So whether Jews, so whether you walk down the streets of Manhattan or, you know, whether, whether you, you ask your Dr. Goldberg whether he learns of the Noahide laws, I mean, it doesn't, and I'm not sure how important that is. But I think just in general, in terms of the population mm -hmm. of the West, in terms of the Americans, European, whatever it is, in terms of Western civilization, not many people have heard of the Noahide laws. Of course, I, the problem is with all this is that it gets back to Christianity. Yes. It gets back to what is the dominating culture and, and mm -hmm. whenever you go back to belief mm -hmm. it's always the default setting is christianity um yeah. with that said even though strangely enough 
I think that Christians themselves really, when they talk about, for example, I mean, basically the Ten Commandments. I mean, right. there's, there's always talk about, I keep the Ten Commandments. And of course, the yeah. truth of the matter is like, do you? You keep the Sabbath, you know, right. for, you know, for an example, you really, right. you really, you really keep, keep, let's go, let's go down the list. How about the first two? The first mm -hmm. one is I am the Lord, your God. The second, you should have no other gods. Mm -hmm. so what about the Trinity? I mean, again, I don't want to get too much into to, to theology and you can split hairs about, about that one, you know, but uh, then, then it, it goes on to, um, you know, talk about, um, not to say the uh, um, Hashem, God's name in vain, mm -hmm. and the people, uh, people keeping that. But 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 here's the funny thing: the three so far in the Ten Commandments, there, they're part of the Noahide laws. You can't curse the Almighty. You, you know, you have to believe in Him. So so far, we're in the exactly. Noahide laws. You know, you keep going. Yeah. Exactly. The, 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 the Sabbath is not is not okay. Skip right. that one. You yes. go to the next one. You know, honoring the parents. That's it's not one of the seven, but it's we've we've talked about it this in this class Correct. many times that it's mm -hmm. that it's been accepted as as an obligation. Yeah. So um, you know, and then basically what, what do we get to after that? You get to the rest of them that shall not murder, right. murder shall steal, not exactly. steal, mm -hmm. you know, you shouldn't bear false witness. Right. Um, you know, you shouldn't um uh you shouldn't covet. What did I skip? But anyway, the bottom line is, besides the Sabbath, it's pretty much, you know, and again, honoring the parents is, is not one of seven, but it's an obligation. You pretty much kind of got the seven there. And I so think it's that's fascinating it's, that, um, that, you know, it's, it's like, oh, it's, you know, so it's interesting that in Christianity that they're stuck on the Ten Commandments as what you person should be doing. It's very close to the Noahide laws, except that their, I think their idea of belief is 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 flawed, very flawed. You know that's another. But and they're also their concept of of the, the level of the obligation of the seven laws. Is yeah. Flawed in terms of and whether you're really you required to or you're not, and and so on. So. But this is what he's talking about in the book that there's already historically a basis and people don't even realize it yes people don't even realize where is this coming from why is this like this the basic morality why did christianity look at the ten commandments and say this is this is it there's so many laws in, in the pentateuch in the five books of moses mm -hmm. but they latched on to these why i mean we do know that these were the you know the revelation and the, the tablets i get it but still there's so many different laws there <laughs> why were these the ones so i think there's a connection there okay. between this idea that this, this is already this was in the culture this is something that abraham spread it's something that shem spread if you've been listening to this class in terms of what we studied about the gear that adam and and noah and shem spread these laws and it's already in the culture it's just they haven't been mentioned by name and that, you know, the different, uh, how do I say, different um, plagiarists, I don't know, different, different, you know, authors came along and say, hey, no, listen, I got this idea. It's my idea, you know. And so basically Christianity came along and said, hey, guess what? You have, this is what you should be doing. It's a new idea, you know, innovative when it wasn't. It's a very, very old idea. And then they get some points of it wrong. But so does that answer your question at all? Yes, I think it, it helps get there. I suppose I'll have to, um, for me, we'll have to have another class. Or <laughs> I would love for you yeah, to be yeah. able to have a class around the differences because for okay. me personally it's looking at the differences not trying to make one better than the other but just trying to understand the differences and the connections and i am constantly seeing more connections mm -hmm. than differences there is one yes we know 
major difference. And we know what that major difference is. But besides that, everything else is so close. And I suppose I've often wondered why I didn't ask why before, because you are right. If you keep asking why, you will come right back to God giving Eve, Adam, this in the Garden of Eden. This is where everything started. And right, right. gave them the template to live I wanna, by. You know? I want to make another point, um, which is may or not be helpful. I hope it's helpful. Um, at least it's something I've noticed since, since interacting with the Benoit community and ex-Christians and so on and so forth. Um, in Orthodox Judaism, um, the written word is, is not the end of the story. It's not, um, it's not binding. That's not the right way to say it, but there are a lot of details missing. And the reliance is more on the oral tradition than the written tradition. The written tradition is kind of like notes and there's a lot missing and some things are even portrayed in an inaccurate way. Um, and in truth is in a certain sense, this makes it more rational because it's conceptual. It's something that was handed down from person wise man and sage to wise man or woman and prophet to prophet. It's, it's not, a, a text doesn't, is not a make or break. You see, a text is a book. It's just a book. It's not revelation. Judaism is about revelation. Revelation is something that was mostly, is then heard. <coughs> As the prophet then communicates his visions and his ideas that was communicated to him by God. So, you know, kind of the problem is not so much of a problem for us as Orthodox Jews. Where is the text? We don't need a text. The real question is, why is, what's with this, like, what is with the addiction, with the, the, you know, with texts? You know, anybody can write a book. I mean, what does it prove in the end of the day? The bigger question is, as he's saying is, what is the word? What is the prophecy? What what is, speaks to the soul? You know, and what 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 is the what is the testament of what God has said? Isn't that that's more important? And then when you when that develops conceptually into something that's really um, whole and symmetrical and sensible, you know, and the, the more you delve into it, the more deep you see it is. Then you know you then you know you're dealing with, with really really something that you got something divine on your hands, you see. The idea the problem is is that the Christian the you know the, the majority culture that stems in Christianity there's a lot of like I just said there's just this there's this hyper focus on the verse. Oh, I have a, let me show you a verse that proves this that proves that. It's not prove anything because. It, it, how can you point to a verse that undermines the very basic tenets of faith? What, what per, what's the point? It, it, to even suggest that you can do such a thing proves that you don't understand anything about, you know, the Jewish understanding of, of our relationship with God. Um, so that's, that's the point. In other words, the fact that, well, where are these seven laws written? Where is it written down? It doesn't matter. You don't need. You don't need to be written down, because as 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 Dr. Cowan is explaining, is that the soul needs these things, and there was a prophecy given first to Adam, handed down from generation to generation. The human beings have to keep this. The very fact that we need a book shows we really don't understand a lot of things. I hear you, Rabbi. That. I you know, it's just it's like, so where, where is it written? Where is there? Uh, let me show you that uh, that God, you know, uh, is, is a person and goes to the bathroom. Because it yeah. says over here that so-and-so. I mean, it's ridiculous. I you can't it. under, you're going to can't undermine the whole basis of faith by pointing to, to you know, pointing to a verse. 
that shows you that there's a misunderstanding of the value of a verse. You know, that could never happen in Judaism. We have to explain that verse means, does mean what it says. It's not even true, but just putting that aside for a moment, mm -hmm. the idea of it is, is just not the way thing, it's not the way Judaism understands uh, theology and our relationship with God. Thanks for that. Uh, you're welcome. Someone asks, who was the founder of the Noahide movement? So what was his name again? Uh, um, anybody want to help me here? Ross, what's, what's the name of this? Is that the oh, Indiana the, Jones of, Noah, of, of the B'nai Noah. What is his name again? Vendel Jones. Vendel Jones. He was basically the founder of the movement. Thank you. He was one of the early yeah. pioneers, yes. One of the early pioneers. He's Actually, Rabbi, often, there's a book. I read about this guy, Amy Pallieri. He's French. He was a French Catholic priest who was like just before the World, of World War II, he kind of started the whole conversation with a rabbi. It's a very interesting book called The Unknown Sanctuary. The Unknown by what? The Unknown Sanctuary. Sound, so maybe you put it in the chat because I'm not sanctuary, sure. the unknown oh, sanctuary. sanctuary. Oh, yes, his friend he was A I M E P A double L I E R E. Amy Pallier, he was a French Catholic priest <laughs> who, surprisingly enough to me, went through a lot of what this was I'm going through mm -hmm. questioning and so on, and he met. A rabbi, the rabbi's name you will know, um, Elijah Benz. His last name is B E N Ben Omojega. That's him. Elijah that, Ben Omojega. That rabbi. He met him and they had a lot of conversations and it helped him to understand what Noahidism because he, he didn't know what it was and he met him. And he exposed him, the rabbi, to this. And he told him, you know, it's a very, very, very interesting book. But to me, because it happened before the war, World War II, to me, he is the kind of beginning of the questioning. And then this guy, Wendell Jones, really blew it up in the late, in the 20th century. But it's a fascinating book when you read about it from exactly what you were just talking about, that intersection between... Christianity and Noahidism and how it's so close and yet they are the Omar. difference. Right. Yeah. So Omar, if, um, I want to just finish up, bring us back to you know, the rest of the students and, and finish up um, reading a text from the book. And as I'm going to point, point out a, a footnote on page 17, footnote three, and we'll finish with that relating to Dr. Frankel's connection with Judaism, he says in, in footnote three, the Noahide religiosity of evident in Frankel derived from a genuine Jewishness in his life, as observed also by Professor David Gutman in Victor Frankel and Logotherapy, Journal of Judaism Civilization. Okay, now notwithstanding his, this is notwithstanding his marriage out of his faith. He put on the tefillin, the phylacteries containing portions of scripture on his arm and head and prayed daily. He chose to be buried in a Jewish cemetery. It was this Jewishness and specifically its supra rational element of belief that ensured for Frankel a genuine transcendence of meaning corresponding to objective universal values. And this is a very interesting point of how uh, juxtapose or, or connect or bridge um, genuine transcendence to objective universal values. It's funny because these values um, are things that human beings can, can or basically at least understand. And, and yet at the same time, they, are tra they transcend. So um, first of all, um, this is very important in terms of its utility, or I should say in terms of the way it affects human society. 
Because even though we understand, for example, thou shalt not steal, we understand a person shouldn't steal, that's one of the known right laws, but we can rationalize it sometimes and say, well, this person, you know, was dishonest to me in business. He, you know, the contract was unethical, so I'm allowed to take it from him. So the idea of objective morality means you can't make up excuses. You can't make up your own rules. It's always wrong. You can't just, you can't bend it like that. And that's the, really the beauty. And it's extremely, it's extremely important. In, in terms of society, as we're gonna learn eventually here, we've quoted in this class many times, the idea of settling the world, not to allow rationalizations. Human beings can rationalize away any moral prohibition. It's not that difficult. Once they're fungible, once you can, you can they're not objective and they're based on, a human judgment, then basically it's a circus. And everything goes because if a person really wants something, they can rationalize it. Well, this person deserves it. And this person did so and so to me. So this shouldn't apply and so on and so forth. There's no end. And there's just um, so one of the fundamental ideas is that they're objective, but not just objective, it's a much higher level, it's transcendent. And that brings it above even life and so itself to a great extent. So, and we had this discussion <clears throat> during when we studied the path of the righteous Gentile about how the, how the punishment at least is per permitted punishment at least, or gen generally the punishment for, the, for violating the no white laws is death. And um, obviously that's pretty scary, but the point is another one. The point is that at least the point I want to bring out at this moment from a positive standpoint is that the seven laws are transcendent of life. See, point is, is that they're divine and they stand above all the all human vicissitudes, all, all of our petty business of our lives. All, all, it's, they're eternal. There's an eternity that, that, that is um, rests or um, emanates from the seven laws. That is, uh, so they're not just what they sound like, good things to do. I'm a nice guy. They literally, you know, are expressions of the divine. Even though they have to do with this world, you know, not to commit adultery, not to, not to murder, not to steal, but they're much bigger than that. And uh, that's a special gift from God also. It's not just he's saying be moral, but he's saying, be like me. And that's a tremendous gift. Okay. So that's where we're up to for today is page 18. Hope to continue the book next time. And we'll probably do a little of the other book. Um, but uh, this, this really, this, this study deserves an entire class. This is a long book. It'll take us quite some time to finish. And there's a lot there.